Good evening. I wonder what you'll be doing on the night of Jan next January the 2nd, 3rd, and January the 3rd, 4th. I realize that that's some weeks ahead yet, but do please make a special note in your diaries, because something very interesting is going to happen in the sky. We're going to have the annual quadranted meteor shower, and it could be really spectacular. I think most people must have seen at least a few meteors or shooting stars, and here's a picture of some of them. They appear as short trails, whereas the stars appear as dots. But obviously, a shooting star is no connection of a real star. A real star is a sun, and a shooting star is very small indeed. Usually, it's smaller than a pin's head. It's a member of the solar system, the sun's family, and it's going round the sun in the same way that we are. But so long as it stays well clear of the Earth, obviously we can't see it because it's much too small and much too faint. But if a meteor comes close to the Earth, below something like um, 120 miles, it enters the upper atmosphere and then it has to push its way through the air. That sets up friction, that in turn causes heat, and the meteor burns away in the streak of radiation that we call a shooting star. And that is all a shooting star is, a tiny particle dying in the Earth's upper atmosphere. And by the time it's come down to something like 40 miles, it's burnt away, and it finishes its journey to the ground in the form of very fine dust. Don't please confuse meteors with meteorites, which are quite different. A meteorite is a much larger body, big enough to come right through the Earth's atmosphere without being burnt away, and lands as a solid chunk. And many museums have got meteorite collections. But they are no connection at all of meteors, and they are much nearer relations of the asteroids or minor planets. And indeed, there may be no real distinction between a large meteorite and a small asteroid. Really big meteorites are luckily very rare, I and mean, we don't often get major falls. But sometimes we do, and they may even cause craters. I suppose the most spectacular of all these meteor craters is the one in Arizona which really should be called the Meteorite Crater, because it was formed something like 22,000 years ago by a vast impact. And I went there earlier on this year, and this is a picture obtained from a helicopter. You can see the wall in the distance there, sloping down to the floor, and in the middle, you can see the remains of some old mine workings, although I'm glad to say that there's no mining going on there now. It really is spectacular, and believe me, uh, scrambling down that wall is quite a business. There's the shadow of our helicopter, and you can see that the wall is fairly steep. We know just how this crater was formed, and there are others like it, although none quite so well preserved as that in Arizona. It's very nearly one mile wide, and um, should you ever go to that part of the world, I do recommend you to pay a visit to Meteorite Crater, because there's nothing else quite like it. But I say again, there's no connection at all between a meteorite and a meteor, so um, if you're watching a meteor shower, there's no fear of being hit on the head by a piece of debris. And in fact, uh, there's no reliable record of anyone being killed by anything falling from the sky. So let's come on now to the genuine shooting star meteors. They are of two main kinds, sporadic and shower. Sporadic meteors are solitary wanderers in space, and they may appear from any direction at any moment. But a large number of meteors go around the sun in definite shoals, and every time the Earth goes through a shoal of meteors, as it does many times per year, we get a shower of shooting stars. The meteors of any particular shower seem to diverge from the radiant of that shower, and you can see that illustrated here. But the meteors are not really behaving like that. In fact, they are moving through space in parallel paths, and all we are seeing is an effect of perspective. And I've always thought that the best way to demonstrate that was by using a motorway. And some time ago, I went onto a bridge overlooking a motorway, and I took this photograph. Obviously, the lanes of the motorway are parallel, but because of perspective, they seem to converge at a point near the horizon, which you can, if you like, call the radiant of the motorways. And if you imagine objects coming down those parallel lanes, they will appear to diverge just as the meteors in a shower do. Not all meteors belong to showers, of course. As I've said, some are sporadic. But when the Earth goes through a shoal of meteors, we get a spectacular shower, and that does happen quite a number of times every year. But there is a limit to what you can learn just by looking at a meteor trail. For example, you can't learn anything about the height of the meteor, and it's very important to know that. The only way to get at that is for two observers to observe the same meteor from different positions on the Earth. And when you do that, the meteor will appear in different positions in the sky to the two observers. 
and you can then construct a diagram in triangulation, and you can work out the height of the meteor. And that was done for the first time in 1796 by two German students named Brandes and Benzenberg. Now, there's a very close association between meteors and comets. A comet is made of a dust and gas, and they can be quite spectacular. This is Bennett's comet of 1970, one of the brightest of modern times, a very easy naked eye object. Although, of course, our old friend Halley's comet will come back in 1986 and should be considerably brighter than that. We have a lot more to say about that nearer the time. But as comets move, they leave debris behind them in the form of meteors. And you can, if you like, say that meteors are really cometary debris. And the Perseids are associated with a periodical comet known as Swift-Tuttle. Its orbit is not very well known, but we think it may be back again in 1982, and if so, the Perseids next year, and in 1982, may be really spectacular, so look out for them then. But in any case, the Perseids are always reliable. We have other meteor showers which are much less reliable, such as the Leonids of November, and they can sometimes give really magnificent displays, as they did in 1966. See quite a number of Leonids on that picture. But they only appear really brilliantly once every 33 years or so, and the next time we can expect a really good Leonid display is in 1999, and we can't be certain of it even then. But meanwhile, we do have the December Geminids, and they have a, these have a ZHR of something like 50. And the radiant lies near the two famous stars in Gemini, the twins, uh, Castor and Pollux. <coughs> now, the maximum of this shower is on December the 13th, 14th. And this year, luckily, uh, the moon is not going to interfere because it's half on the 15th, and so it'll only be obtrusive during the very latter part of the shower, which goes on for something like a week. So, um, for the, uh, that, that part of December, you may be lucky enough to see a good many bright Geminids. And those are, again, fairly consistent. But now let's turn to a shower of a very different kind, the one I really want to talk about this evening, and that is the Quadrantid Shower. And this is named after a constellation which no longer exists. Uh, the constellation Quadrans, the Quadrant, uh, was created uh, here, just near Ursa Major, the Great Bear, by the German astronomer Johann Bode, who had a habit of putting new constellations in the sky, others with barbarous names, so we had Sceptrum Brandenburgican and Officina Typographica and Lockium Funis and so on, and mercifully, these have been erased from the sky map. I think, actually, that Quadrants was one of Bode's better efforts, but when the International Astronomical Union revised all the constellation boundaries in 1930, they very firmly eliminated many of the smaller groups, and one of those eliminated uh, was Quadrants, so we no longer uh, have um, a Quadrants constellation. But we still remember it because the meteors coming from that particular position in the sky are still known as the Quadrantids. And the main point about this shower is that it's very brief. It doesn't go on for something like a week, as the Demonids do, or more than a fortnight, as the Perseids do. It's concentrated in only a few hours, and so you have to catch it at its very best. And if the moon's in the wrong part of the sky, the meteors are largely drowned. But this year, the moon is going to be out of the way, and conditions for the Quadrantids are really very favorable. To show you how brief the maximum is, let's look at the graph for 1979. And I choose 1979, not 1980, because the 1980 shower wasn't nearly so well observed. Well, in 1979, the maximum occurred at about four hours on January the 4th, and as you can see, the ZHR went up to about 90, but it fell away very markedly to either side of that brief peak. <coughs> And moreover, the Quadrantids are not equally brilliant every year. And uh, you can see that from this chart. We have the peak hourly rate on the left against the date on the bottom. And you can see there that in 1977, uh, the peak rate was well over the 180 mark. And the Quadrantids could be just as spectacular as that this year. So uh, we never quite know what's going to happen, but the outlook is good. Now, the Quadrantids are not associated with any known comet. But it's thought that there may have been a Quadrantid comet a long time ago. Uh, we know the orbit of the Quadrantids today, and uh, it goes out well beyond the path of Jupiter. And Jupiter, in fact, does perturb the Quadrantid shower, and we are not going to see it indefinitely. It's thought that before about 1832, the Earth didn't go through the mainstream, and so we didn't see any Quadrantids. And because of the effects of Jupiter, in something like 500 years from now, the stream will again avoid the Earth. And that's another very good reason for studying the Quadrantids so closely. We are watching a meteor stream actually evolve. 
So far as the possible quadranted comet was concerned, well, it certainly is not there now, and we think it probably disintegrated something like 1,500 years ago. And this is by no means unexpected, because comets tend to be short-lived things, and they can disintegrate. And the very famous case of that was the comet known as Beeler's Comet, which was seen in the last century and had a period of nearly seven years. Well, it came back in 1845 on schedule, and it broke in two pieces. And this is a drawing made at the time by the Italian astronomer Secchi, which shows the twin Beeler's comets. Of course, there's no photograph of it. This was long before photography came along. Well, the comets came back again in 1852, but that was their last appearance. They have never been seen again as comets, but in 1872, a shower of meteors was seen to come from the position in the sky where the comet ought to have been. And there's no doubt at all that these meteors did represent the debris of the dead comet. And very probably the quadrantids represent the debris of a comet that died a long time ago. And the quadrantids may either be small and faint, but they may be very bright. And sometimes we even get fireballs. And a fireball is simply a very brilliant meteor, a very brilliant meteor. And I've seen some fireballs which are, in fact, brighter than the full moon. Well, obviously, I can't promise you uh, any fireballs with next year's quadrantids, but um, it's not impossible. So if you keep a good look out, you may easily be lucky enough to see them. I do realize, of course, that to see the quadrantids at their best uh, means getting up early or going to bed late, whichever way you put it, because the best time is going to be between midnight and dawn on the early morning of January the 3rd. But you'll also get a supply of bright planets. You get Venus rising about an hour before the sun, and you also get Jupiter and Saturn in Virgo uh, quite close together. Jupiter's the brighter of the two. But um, if you look at Saturn with a telescope, you will see that the rings have come back into view. Last year, the rings were edgewise on and you couldn't see them properly, but this year you can, and by the mid-1980s, Saturn will regain its customary beauty. So um, have a look at it if you can. But, of course, the main target on that morning is going to be the quadranted meteor shower. And if you want to make really useful observations, it's a good idea to try and define the track. And this can be done quite simply by using a stick. Let me show you what I mean. The trick is to note the position where the meteor has flashed across the sky and note that position against the stars. And then hold up your stick against the sky and try and work out just where the meteor began and where it ended. And if you know your star patterns and you can recognize a star at that end of the track and then at the far end of the track, you'll know exactly where the meteor sped past. And that's very important information. Moreover, you may like to try your hand at meteor photography. And the trick there is to uh, open the shutter of your camera, point it somewhere near the radiant, and simply wait in the hope that a meteor will flash across the field of view. Only be careful not to leave the shutter open for too long, or you're going to have trouble with dewing. And sometimes you can capture really spectacular meteors. That's a time exposure, obviously. The stars are trails going from uh, top left to bottom right, and you can see the meteor flashing across the, uh, uh, across the photograph. And you can get really good pictures like that. But now let's come on to this real quadranted display of next January 2nd, 3rd. And we need your help, because it's very important to observe this shower as carefully as we can. And the whole project is being coordinated by the meteor section of the British Astronomical Association. And the more observers we have, the better our information is going to be. So if you see a quadranted meteor, uh, what you want to note is, first of all, the time, then the track, the magnitude, the duration, how long you can see it, the color, and any other special characteristics. And if you can do that, it's going to be very useful indeed. And if so, would you be kind enough to send in your results to the Meteor Section, British Astronomical Association, Burlington House, Piccadilly, London, W1VONL. I'll repeat that. Meteor Section, BAA, or British Astronomical Association, Burlington House, Piccadilly, London, W1VONL. And if you do that, we will be extremely grateful, and it's going to be a really important scientific work. I realize, of course, that meteors are the junior members of the solar system. They are small, they are friable, and we only see them just as they are dying. But they are important and they're interesting. There's a great deal about them that we don't know, and the quadrantids are of special interest. So um, let's all hope that we have nice, clear nights next January 2nd, 3rd, and January 3rd, 4th. Good night. <laughs>